Reverend Dr. David Wilkinson is an acclaimed astrophysicist, theologian, and Methodist minister. He is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, a theologian at Durham University, and the principal of St. John's College. As a scientist, David studied the formation of stars and the evolution of galaxies. As a minister, his work focused on the practical and spiritual needs of people living in the inner city communities of Liverpool. The author of numerous books and publications, David engages his outstanding ability as thinker and communicator to weave together the dialogue of science and Christian faith in the public square. Today, David will share his thoughts on the intersection of faith and science. St. Luke's, please give a warm welcome to Reverend Dr. David Wilkinson. Well, that's very kind of you to uh, greet me in that way. And as I said in the first service, I was a little um, surprised by the video. I didn't think there would be a video introducing me. Uh, and to be honest, I mean, the video is very impressive. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing myself preach this morning. Um, I hope that's not, I mean, it's lovely to be with you at, at St. Luke's. Uh, and there is a real sense of the move of the spirit here. And it's great to be part of that. I came many years ago, Kent, you invited me probably two decades ago. Um, thank you, Rob, for inviting me back. It's only taken 20 years or so um, <laughs> to come back. Um, and it's just thanks for those who've made it possible. I bring you greetings from Durham in the northeast of England, about 240 miles north of London. And uh, occasionally I have to get the train from Durham to London. I was on the train the other day and the, sat down and the person beside me said, uh, what do you do? <laughs> well, I said, I'm a Methodist minister and I teach theology these days. I never quite know how people will react when I say that. And this man's eyes seem to fill with fear as he thought to himself, oh no, three hours sitting beside a religious fanatic. So he quickly tried to change the topic of conversation. He said, what did you do before that? <laughs> I said, I did research in theoretical astrophysics. <laughs> this time, the man's eyes glazed <laughs> as he thought to himself, what on earth does he mean by that? but he knew it was something to do with science. And so he asked me the question that many people have asked me over the years, how can you be a scientist and a Christian? Or how can you be a scientist and a Christian with integrity? Now, you guys are all extremely well-educated in theoretical astrophysics, aren't you? <laughs> it's very easy. It's twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. <laughs> That's basically all that astrophysics is. Um, and astrophysics then goes on to say, up above the world so high, a contracting ball of hot hydrogen gas undergoing nuclear fusion. So, I mean, it just scans in the same way as the nursery rhyme. But uh, it's been an interesting month or so for astrophysics. Have you heard about the James Webb Telescope? Did you see images like this one? This is one of the deep fields from James Webb. Um, some of the galaxies that you see on that picture, the light set off from those galaxies over 13 billion years ago to reach us. The light from the sun takes about eight minutes to make its journey to the Earth. The light from these galaxies take, takes over 13 billion years. And each of those galaxies typically contains about 100 billion stars. And how many galaxies are there in the universe? Well, you're all really good at astrophysics, so you know there's about 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Now, I know it's a Sunday morning, but if I asked you the question, how many galaxies are there in the universe? It's very easy. All you have to do is multiply 100 billion by 100 billion, and the answer is a lot. 
I mean something like all the grains of sand on the beaches of the world, as how many stars there are in the universe. And the next slide from Hubble shows you um, where those stars come from. This is a great cloud of hydrogen gas with lots of dust in it. And this is a maternity hospital for stars. It'll give birth to about 10,000 stars, each the same size as our own sun. And when you look at these kind of pictures from James Webb, then as the great Louis Armstrong used to sing, uh, what a wonderful world. There's a sense in which when we look at this world and the beauty of it, there is a sense of awe and a wow that goes on. And yet, uh, there are other images of the world. You'll see them in the next slide. Of natural disasters, of flooding and earthquake, which preferentially hit those who are poor and vulnerable in our communities and our societies. Same is true of the pandemic. This virus, which wreaked havoc and still does over many, many nations. And then we also see in humanity and injustice, not just heavy artillery flattening cities in Eastern Europe, but many armed conflicts throughout the world which never get the publicity that Ukraine is getting at the moment. And if there's a wow from the James Webb Space Telescope, when you look at these pictures, there's a sense of this beautiful world at times is ugly and fragile and at times cruel. Now the question then is, how do we know what God is like? We can rejoice in the beauty of the universe and say, well, God is wonderful and majestic and great and how beautifully we sang about that in terms of the music, thank you. And yet as we expressed in our prayers, there's a longing about the world is not as it should be. So what is this God like who created this world? And what does this world mean for God? Is God at work in this world or does he simply set off the blue touch paper, the explosion of the Big Bang, and then go for a cup of tea not to have anything more to do with it? And what does it mean for us to be disciples in the image of God today? Well, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have the James Webb telescope, but they didn't have street lighting either, so they could see the sky. And that's why the psalmist would say, the heavens declare the glory of God. But they also had illness. They also had death. They'd experienced as the people of Israel exile in Babylon where they'd been carried away, their temple had been destroyed, and then they came back, but now they were under Roman rule, an intense, uh, unstable political situation. Life was harsh. And so how do you know what God is like? Well, John, as he writes his account of the life of Jesus, prefaces it with a prologue. We heard some of the verses read to us. And if you've got Bibles with you this morning, you've got them on your phone or whatever, you might just want to turn to John chapter one. Because what John does is he says that in the word made flesh, in Jesus, there's a key to understanding all of this. So the first thing that he says is that Jesus the Word shows us the truth of what the Creator God is like. Jesus the Word shows us the truth of what the Creator God is like. A friend of mine a number of years ago who's an atheist, wrote a book in which he argued against the existence of God. 
He said, the universe is very, very big. Our minds are very, very small. He said, how could we ever understand something greater than the universe itself, God, with very small minds? God is infinite, our minds are finite. He said, how could we ever understand what God is like? But says the Christian, with respect, we agreed with you. But what if that God decided to reveal God's self to the finite mind in the way that the finite mind could understand? That's at the heart of John's claim, that we don't figure out God by ourselves, but that God shows us, reveals to us what God is like. And John, when he begins his gospel, uh, doesn't kind of start with, by the way, I knew this man, Jesus. He does a bit of philosophy with us. Now, are you ready for 30 seconds of philosophy this morning? We've done the science. Ready for the philosophy? John, thank you. I, really, I, I should say, can I get an amen to that? Is that right? I'm well under 40, by the way. No. Um, <laughs> John takes two themes in the ancient world and he puts them together. One is the Greek understanding of the word logos, which represents the scientific rationality behind the universe, the order. And he puts it together with the Hebrew understanding of the word, which is God's personal activity in creation. So do you remember in Genesis, in the creation story, God said, and it was so. And John puts these two things together, and he writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I can see you're knocked out by that philosophy this morning, because <laughs> what John has done is he said, the order and the rationality in the universe is because of the personal activity of God. Now, he then goes on to say something even more remarkable. He says, this word became flesh and lived amongst us. We beheld his glory. No one has ever seen God, but the only son, Jesus, has made him known. God became a human being. Literally, it can be translated, God pitched his tent with us. God moved into our neighborhood. Isn't that exciting? So that we don't figure out what God is like by simply looking at the universe, God shows us what God is like by moving into our neighborhood in Jesus. So in a human being, Jesus, we see what God is like. And later on in the gospel, John's going to talk about this in lots of different ways, but he does it through two of my favorite disciples later on in the gospel. Uh, one of my favorites is Thomas. I love Thomas. He's not a doubter. He's a questioner. Thomas is the guy who asks the questions that all the other disciples are too embarrassed to ask. So Jesus talking about his death says, and you know the way where I am going. Now, the disciples probably at that point all nodded in that sagely Christian way, <laughs> which we feel we have to do when we have no idea what the preacher is on about. <laughs> but we don't want to show our neighbors that we don't understand. So they're all going, we have no idea what he's going on about, but we're not gonna say anything. But it's Thomas who sticks his hand up and says, Jesus, what on earth are you going on about? We have no idea what you mean by the way where I am going. That point Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And then my second favorite disciple comes in. This is Philip. Philip's the type of bloke 
who is always two minutes behind everything that's happening. Have you ever met that type of person? The type of person at a church meeting who when the agenda has been and you get to, to number eight, any other business just before you can get home and watch the television, the type of person who says, excuse me a moment, can we go back to number two on the agenda, please? I can see one or two nudging other people saying, <laughs> Philip's always half an hour behind the conversation. So Jesus just said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Philip then says, Lord, show us the Father. Can you imagine what the other disciples were thinking? Philip, shut up. <laughs> He's already told us he is the way, the truth, and the life. What on earth are you asking? Show us the Father. He's already told us. Jesus says, Philip, have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me. He who's seen me has seen the Father. In answer to the question, what is God like? Christians reply, he is like Jesus. And so if you're new to this church or new to Christianity and you're thinking about yourself, what is this God like that people are worshiping? Can I encourage you just to look at Jesus? Or it may be that you've been here for a long time uh, and you're going through a, 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 a moment in life, either because of illness or grief or breakup of a relationship, where you're thinking, what is this God like? I've, I've believed, I've trusted in you, Lord, but what's this all about? This week, um, I received news that a dear friend of mine uh, has just been diagnosed with an incurable form of cancer. I find myself saying, Lord, why? Have you ever found yourself asking the question, Lord, why? moments like that, I need to go back to Jesus to be reminded that this is what God is like. That's the first point. Second, you still with me? Yes. Amen? Amen? I'm learning this thing as we go on. <laughs> Such a good model, thank you. <laughs> Second thing is this. Jesus, the Word, shows us the truth of what the creation means to God. Jesus, the Word, shows us the truth of what the creation means to God. There are those religions and there are those branches of Christianity which kind of say that this life isn't important. The only important thing is getting right with God so that you, at death, a soul kind of liberates from the body and you float up into some kind of planar harp on a cloud in a grayish, ghost-like existence. And the Greeks believed in a dualism between body and spirit. The Greeks believed that the spirit was good and the body was bad. Jesus, the Word, became flesh, physical embodiment. He moved into our neighborhood as a human being. And the word flesh there is often used in the New Testament, not just of human embodiment, but it can sometimes be used of that which is vulnerable to sin in the human person. Jesus moved into the mess of what it means to be human, into the mess of the neighborhood, into the mess of the world. He didn't simply float six foot above the dirt and the grubbiness of the world. He moved into our neighborhood. He went into this world as a human being. If we had, Rob, you said we've got about four hours in this service, is that right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if we had five hours, we'd talk about the importance of John the Baptist and history. We'd talk about the importance of that word cosmos, world. But the point is that Jesus, the word becoming flesh, is an affirmation of this world 
as created as an important to God. God hasn't lost hope. God hasn't come to the end of his purposes with this world. Jesus, the Word, shows us that God wants to renew, transform this world, not just the new creation, but transform this world into the new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. You see, the Greeks would say that this world isn't special. The Greeks would say that sex was bad, that work was to be tolerated, that life was not to be enjoyed, you simply looked forward to that which is to come, that religion was only about the spiritual, that God wasn't interested in politics. None of that is biblical Christianity. Jesus, the Word, becoming flesh, says that sex in the right context is good, that this life has value and meaning as well as the next that what we do with our leisure time is important, that looking after the environment and stopping climate change is important, that there are issues of justice and politics which are important to God, and that your work day by day, whatever it is, is important to God. And particularly if you're a scientist <laughs> or an engineer do you know, I go to some churches, I'm sure this isn't one of these churches, where there's often a spiritual hierarchy of calling. Do you know what I mean by that? The most holy people are the missionaries, and then just slightly below that, the pastors. <laughs> and then just slightly below that, uh, doctors and nurses, caring professions, and teachers. And then often right at the bottom of the pile, the least holy are the accountants and the scientists. <laughs> That's not what God thinks. You know, I mean, if a young person in a congregation, again, I'm sure it doesn't happen here, says the Lord wants me to go to Bible college, often we say hallelujah, we bring them to the front, we lay hands on them, we give them a big check to help them with their expenses, and we say we're gonna pray for you. But if a young person says, I want to do chemistry at university, do we bring them to the front? Do we go hallelujah? Do we lay hands on them? Do we give them a big check? Because to be a scientist or a technologist or an engineer is as much a Christian calling as it is to be a pastor, yeah? And for those of you, for those of you who are scientists who are studying science at school or college or university, for those of you who teach science, for those of you who work with engineering or technology, we want to say thank you this morning. And we want to affirm you in your Christian calling. Kepler, the great astronomer, once said that science is thinking God's thoughts after him. And Jesus, the word becoming flesh, is about God's affirmation of the everyday. Third thing, and uh, you still with me? Right, thank you. Yeah. I know it doesn't work for a British person, but... Third thing is this. Jesus, the Word, shows us the truth of what creation is meant to be. Jesus, the Word, shows us the truth of what creation is meant to be. You see, Jesus, the one who is full of grace and truth, isn't just fully God, but in an amazing way, is also fully human. And in his humanity, we see what human beings can truly be, full of grace and truth. I love that description of Jesus, full of grace. Grace is God's extravagant generosity and truth. And not does Jesus only give us a picture of what we can be, he also is the mechanism through which God leads us to that. Because Jesus becoming flesh, his flesh will be pierced on the cross. 
his flesh will die our death on the cross so that you can be given a, a new start. You can be offered forgiveness. You can experience the resurrection power of Jesus because he died for us to give us a new start. Verse 12 to 13, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. Because Jesus the Word became flesh, we can be transformed. Victor Hugo, commenting on the French Revolution, once said that revolution can change everything apart from the human heart. And what's the problem with the world is the human heart. But in Jesus, the human heart can be changed. My heart can be changed. Your heart can be changed. And we can be transformed to be people full of grace and truth. Do you long for that? What would it look like for a church to be full of grace and truth? What would it look like for a local community to be full of grace and truth? What would it look like for our national life to be full of grace and truth? That's the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know if you've heard, we've had a few political problems in the UK uh, recently with a prime minister who uh, has been lying, has been thrown out of office. Um, and I have to say, a political discourse nationally, which is not about truth and grace, but is often about defining against the other, about uh, aggression and hatred and injustice. I'm sure you don't have any of that in the US, by the way. <laughs> that never happens here, does it? What would it be like for our national discourse, our political discourse, to be full of grace and truth. And for those of you who are local leaders in communities, I thank God for you as Christians to model what it means to be full of grace and truth. We started with the James Webb Telescope, a beautiful world, and yet a world at times which is ugly. In the midst of that, are you looking for what God is like? Can I encourage you to look at Jesus? Are you thinking to yourself, what does this creation mean to God? God became flesh in Jesus. And are you a sense in which you long for a world, you long for a life full of grace and truth? To all who received him, who believed in his name, that can happen this morning, now, here, in this moment, to become children of God. When Stephen Hawking died, great British astrophysicist, I was invited to a conference in Jerusalem on the legacy of Stephen Hawking's work. And at dinner one night, one of these great astrophysicists turned to me and said, David, you're a Christian. He said, I'm an atheist. He said, one of the things I don't understand about Christians is why do you believe that God is good? He said, after all, I can see some good things in the universe, but he says, I can see some horrid things in the universe. It was one of those moments where at dinner we had a big window and I could look out across the old city of Jerusalem. And I was able to say, I believe that God is good because 2,000 years ago, a man walked through those streets out there, and in his teaching and his deeds, in his love of people, I see that God is good. And just over there, he was put to death on a cross for me, that I see that God so loved the world. And just over there, he was raised from the dead to new life. That's why I believe that God is good. And he paused for a moment, my friend, and he said, you know, I've never heard that before. See, too often we say lots of things as a church, 
do we offer Christ day by day to those around us? I'm a simple preacher from England, and this morning I offer you Christ, the Word made flesh. Will you receive him? Thank you.